Would you would you please stand for the presentation of the colors? Girls, right up, stand. Jen, Eric, colors. Thank you. You may now be seated. Good evening, and welcome to the 2013 National Honor Society Induction Ceremony. My name is Allison Mifflin, and accompanying me on my right is my co-chair, Quincy Siegel. Thank you, parents, families, friends, and teachers, for joining us and congratulating the new members on such a remarkable achievement. The National Honor Society is a prestigious organization in which few are presented with the opportunity to join. Its members are known for their high standards of scholarship, service, leadership, and character, all of which these inductees have clearly demonstrated. As members, these outstanding students will be admired by their peers for their commitment to their education as well as their community. They will also enjoy the collegiality fostered by this organization. While I've met many new friends through National Honor Society, I have learned just as many, if not more, lessons. I wish the new members the best of luck and congratulations. I would now like to introduce the rest of the stage. Starting from my far right, we have Lana Welford, recipient of the Character Scholarship. Bryce Willey, recipient of the Leadership Scholarship. Kazia Thomas, recipient of the Service Scholarship. Shanali Warnakola Saria, recipient of the Scholarship Award, Lauren Ballantyne, President of National Honor Society, and Peter Davis, Head of Galveston Beach Patrol. On my immediate left is Dr. Matthew Hay, President of the GISD School Board, Mr. Larry Nichols, GISD Superintendent, Mr. Joseph Pillar, Principal of Ball High, Dr. Marsha Ricks, TSTEM Director, Jalen Walker, and Naomi Duru recipient of the Outstanding Senior Scholarship. Our special guests tonight include Ms. Carol Greeny Wurst. Now we'd like to welcome Dr. Hay to give his opening remarks. Good evening. I would also like to welcome all of you here tonight to the 2013 Ball High School National Honor Society Ceremony. Please excuse my voice, but between allergies and attending the Ball High Tornadoes baseball game last night where it took nine innings to beat Santa Fe one to nothing to move into second place, I've kind of lost most of the voice. Tonight we celebrate these 63 students and their induction into the National Honor Society. Those of you in the audience should be proud of these young men and women as they have been chosen due to their scholarship, leadership, service, and character. I was talking earlier today to my father, and he reminded me that it was about 30 years ago that he sat in an auditorium like you did, or tonight, and watched proudly as I received my certificate and pin, and was inducted into the Nacogdoches National Honor Society chapter. He was an educator before he retired, and he always used to remind me that although an event like tonight is a great honor, marking what these young men and women have already accomplished, 
It's also a beginning for these students to show their future potential. The National Honor Society's purpose was to create enthusiasm for scholarship, to stimulate a desire to render service, to promote leadership, and to develop character in students. This was purposely written in future tense because these students will be eventually remembered for what they do going forward. I commend all you students tonight for beginning this journey and congratulations on in being inducted into the National Honor Society. Thank you, Dr. Hay. Now I'd like to call on Mr. Nichols to present his welcoming remarks. The Central Office staff also wants to congratulate you on your honor that you're going to receive tonight. You know, honor is an interesting word. It's a word that we like to be associated with, honor. And I am confident that you, in your high school career, will bring honor to yourself and honor to Ball High. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Next, we have Mr. Pillar and Dr. Ricks to say a few words. Uh, good evening. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Ball High's faculty and staff, we'd like to say thank you for coming out uh, and uh, showing these students just how special they truly are. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Ricks, and we'll get this started. Welcome and enjoy the ceremony. Thank you. Thank you for those welcoming remarks. I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Peter Davis. Most of us know the keynote speaker, Peter Davis. You see him on the beach, at junior lifeguards, at the lifeguard barbecue, and all around town. Peter has been an open water lifeguard for 30 years, the face of Beach Patrol, and currently serves as chief of the Galveston Beach Patrol and of the Park Board Police Department. He is responsible for over 100 lifeguards and police officers, as well as a junior lifeguard program of about 100, beach, of about 100 kids and teens. He volunteers as the Secretary General of the Americas Region of the International Life Saving Federation, as well as the Vice President of the United States Life Saving Association. He holds a BA in Psychology from Trinity University and an MFA in Studio Art from the University of California at Davis. Peter is an instructor for open water lifeguarding and personal watercraft rescue, an emergency medical technician, a peace officer, and a public safety diver. He produced and co-wrote the educational video, Texas Beaches, Know the Dangers, which won both the National Telly and Communicator, Communicators Awards. He is also somewhat of a surf celebrity, having been featured in the popular surf documentary, Step Into Liquid. He has traveled extensively in Central and South America, Asia, and Africa, co-edited the Spanish edition of the USLA Manual, and spearheaded a great deal of life-saving development work around the world, particularly in Central and South America. In addition to his life-saving career, Peter, a seventh-generation Galvestonian, has taught art in Galveston, Brooklyn, and Botswana. He spends his free time surfing, training, and spending time on the beach with his seven-year-old daughter, Kai. He loves Galveston and was the art director of the Galveston Seawall Mural Project. We are super honored to have him come speak for us today, so please give a warm round of applause to Peter Davis. Good evening. I see a lot of familiar faces out there. Um, so I, I was telling Quincy, and thank you for the invite, specifically to you, and to all of you, I feel very um, privileged and honored to be part of this evening and part of this group, um, and, and very flattered to be here. I hope the speech goes good. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I had a, a speech planned um, that was probably kind of boring. Um, and my wife was, you know, kind of helping me with it. And she's like, well, what do you want to talk about? And I was like, well, I'd like to talk about something that people care to hear. She's like, well, what do you got so far? And I said, like, well, it's about values and leadership and that. And she goes, ah, ah. And she stopped me right there. And she said, you think they want to hear about that? And I was like, probably not. <laughs> so I decided uh, to write about something very close to my heart, but something that also uh, encapsulates core values that can be applicable to other areas or to anywhere so I decided to talk about surfing hope you guys don't mind uh, because I see a lot of junior guards and surfers and all kind of stuff out in the audience and I also wanted to talk about surfing because we all know a lot about it even if we don't specifically surf but being from a coastal area and we know a lot about what um, constitutes 
the, I guess, the essence of what a surfer is. So let's, let's see how it goes. I started surfing in 1976. Um, and I graduated from Ball High School in 1983, so I'm especially privileged to be here because of that. Um, at the time, uh, I had this, this guy across the street, he was a neighbor named David Schutz, and we bought these old, beat up, cruddy, 70s style surfboards, and we bought them in the wintertime and we couldn't go out yet, so we were sitting on top of our beds, we put them on there, and we tried to, you know, see what it would be like to actually surf, and we'd go out and boogie board, you know, in the, in the summertime we'd done that, so, we were trying to see how it would be to actually surf. Um, we had no clue what we were trying to do. Um, we started, my mom was always sitting on the pier watching. I don't know what she would have done if I got in trouble, but she was always right there with us. She bought dogs, everybody was down there. And like a lot of Galveston people, we spend a lot of time on the beach and on the seawall. Just like a lot of you guys do, I'm sure. Um, and then I kind of hooked up with a group of guys, and I was about eighth grade or so. And it was a real social activity for me. It was sort of like a, a peer group. Uh, we could identify with each other, support each other. And it was a good friendship based on this common bond of, of I, don't, I don't know if it was really surfing. It was more sort of just like the image of what a surfer is at the time. And little by little, I started spending more and more time in the water um, and realized that I was surfing more alone, really, than I was with other people. And that there were things about this particular sport or that particular environment that drew me to it. And part of that was when I was sitting in the seats that you're in right now and the age you're in, like a lot of you, I had suffered a lot. And a lot, you know, like a lot of people, like everyone goes through stuff throughout their life and some of us it hits earlier than others. So I had, um, you know, a really messy divorce and a lot of ugly stuff at home and some financial problems. Um, so I was going putting on my high school face because we don't share who we are with each other all the time, especially at certain ages, and um, you know, come here and acting like I wasn't hurting inside and all that. And I was working at night, uh, spending about 40 hours a week working at a restaurant and sometimes extra jobs on the weekends because we were having, you know, trying to support the family and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of missed a lot of the, the fun times in high school, and I unfortunately was not an Honor Society student, although I would have loved to have been that. Um, so what, what happened was my escape became surfing. And so it became more than just a sport of friendship or a sport for image, but it became also um, a way to sort of center myself, to kind of get myself back in. And some of that was the ocean and some was the actual, the actual sport of surfing. Um, and then as I grew up and I hit high school and everything, while I was in high school, um, I still surfed a lot alone, but I also had friends that did, and we were, we were uh, well, the word is, uh, I don't know if you still use it, but the word was hardcore. We were really hardcore about it back then. And hardcore is really, it's just another word for committed, which is about commitment. And so it, it was just a more palatable word for us. We said we were hardcore, but really we were committed to this thing, and that was a real lesson for us to be able to commit to something like that. The reason I kept surfing and still do now um, was because I, I think that there was something, it's, it's hard to talk about, uh, but I think that there was something where you, it was a connection to something a little bit intangible, but something beyond our physical experience here. And so that part of that was being part of the ocean or close to the ocean where there are forces out there that we do not understand, nor will we, even though we feel sort of a, a, a we're drawn to it because we're actually from the ocean and our blood is basically salt water with a few other things mixed in so we still feel this connection to the ocean whether it's going and looking at it or spending time with an activity fishing or surfing or whatever down in the ocean so I think that that was that was something that kept drawing me there and then there was another part of it that was about that experience of riding a wave and you know so we we have this sort of oh catch a wave this that but riding a wave is it is it it puts you in a in a, a state that is not like our normal existence when we go through life. And you don't have to have surfed to understand what I'm talking about. It could be the moment when the basketball leaves your hand and time slows down and you, your heart beats slow. It sounds like it's probably really beating fast. And it hovers and you freeze and you're focused only on that, that one thing. You're not aware of yourself, but you're aware of yourself. You're not consciously, self-consciously aware of yourself, but you have a deep awareness 
of that moment right then. And you guys, you have, each of you knows what I'm talking about. Each of you has felt that making art or reading or playing tennis or running or, you know, all kind of meditating. I mean, it could be all kind of things that bring you to that point. And for me, it just happened to be surfing that put me in that, that frame of mind. So the, 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 the feeling part of this ocean and also getting myself in a position where I was in that moment beyond my sort of physical existence, at least for just a couple of seconds, as I caught a wave, is an addiction. And it's a good addiction. And it's a gateway to, to more. It's a connection to something beyond us. So when I talk about surfing, when I bring the word up, there's stuff that's in your head automatically. You have this sort of idea of what surfing is as a sport or an activity. You can kind of picture it in your head or whatever. But you also probably have some kind of something in there that says, what's a surfer? And so I think there's a difference between what you would consider um, sort of a true surfer versus someone who surfs and who does other activities and you know that kind of stuff. And I know that that sort of image changes through the decades and we're talking about 30 something, almost 40 years of surfing, uh, just in, in my personal experience. And I know the image has kind of changed through the times, like in the 70s and 60s, it was like this soul surfer, you know, you're on a search, you're like a Buddhist monk looking for, you know, looking for nirvana. Um, and then in the, in, the, in, the, in the 80s, it became a very competitive sport and surfing became a very commercial, commercial deal. And from that sprung out skateboarding and all kind of other activities, snowboarding and all that stuff. And it meant a lot of money, it also meant a lot of competition and it sort of signified something else. Um, and then the 90s, it was just sort of floating around because it got so popular that everyone does it. Now picture, in 1981, when I was, whatever you are, 15 or so, um, sophomore in high school, um, there were probably 30 people in the whole of Ball High that, that were surfers. And there was not really anybody that surfed just a little bit. It was sort of you did it or you didn't do it. That's real different now. I think you guys all know tons of people who surf and do a lot of other sports and everything. So. So let's talk about, let's focus on for a minute, what is the sort of essence of a surfer? Like, not just as a practitioner of the sport, but also as the embodiment of what, of what the core values um, that would be represented by that. And I just kind of picked through them um, in my mind, and I just, uh, uh, simplicity, simplicity of lifestyle, balance, strength, commitment, connection. And so when we talk about something like simplicity, I go to my grandma. My grandma was, she was amazing. She was this uh, old kind of German descent woman and she was really just very stoic and unemotional. Um, and when I was really young, she was kind of chubby and she had a bunch of junk in her house and everything. And as she aged, she kind of changed. She got, she started getting rid of things and she started simplifying her life and she became Either as a result of that, I don't know if it's a chicken or egg thing, but she became very sort of content and comfortable with herself. And I remember when she died, my friend and I went up to clear out her apartment, and it took us all of an hour and maybe ten minutes to clear out every single thing she had. We opened her closet, and most people's closets are full of what? Shoes and stuff they haven't worn in five years and all that kind of stuff. Man, in hers, it was like ten dresses, pull them out, done. I mean, it was, it was amazing, and, and I think that, that that simplicity, the way she lived her life, was a very important value, and I think that that, you know, it's, a, it's sort of what you think of as surfers who live a very sort of elemental lifestyle, but it, 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 was, it was a really, it's a good way to live. Not a lot of distractions, uh, you know, technology doesn't get in your way, you don't have too much stuff to focus on, and it helps you sort of remember what things are important in our existence and in our life. I. I had the unbelievable good fortune to live in southern Africa for a while uh, in a country called Botswana, which is sort of like Texas. It's, I think it's one million people and three million cattle, probably like old old version of what Texas used to be. Um, and I, I knew so many people there that lived just really, really nice lives. I mean, they were pretty happy as a general rule compared to the people I know here. Um, and the, and they, I think that a big part, well, Botswana is a fairly rich country by African standards, so there weren't like tons of people hungry and there wasn't, you know, all that kind of stuff. But there were, you know, a very, very rich person in the village I lived in would have a pair of shoes. 
Um, you know, and the students, I, I taught art, so the students I taught, um, they had one school uniform and they wore it. And then on the weekend they had their other clothes. And so it was just really not a lot of material things that they had, but they, they seemed to be able to replace that with stuff that was very significant. And I, 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 you know, I just remember the communication style that people had where people really listened before they spoke and they didn't cut each other off. Have you ever noticed how many times we cut each other off during a conversation? I find myself doing it and, and trying to stop myself and then falling back into it. But I think we live these fast-paced lifestyles where we're consumers, we're tearing through the technology, we're tearing through the conversations, we're trying to get all this stuff done. We basically have collective cultural ADD. And I, that was real different than when I came back, it was a hard adjustment for me, just communication was difficult and that was something that I'll never forget, but I think it was a result of that simple, that simple lifestyle. And I, and I think it was a result of not filling your life with noise, just noise, noise, to keep yourself from having to know yourself, to keep yourself from having to really hear other people, and to keep yourself from feeling the depths of the emotion that we feel on a day-to-day, -day, on a day-to-day, -day, just, just to be a person. I mean, just to, there's so much stuff that we don't let ourselves feel because we just, we just fill it up. And so I think that one lesson I, I would hope that I can reach by the time I'm an older guy um, is, is to remember that that value of, of simplicity, that core value is a really important part of, of good living and of being, reaching our potential as people. I don't mean you shouldn't play video games, I'm not trying to say that, I just say everything has its place. Um, the second core value I talked about was balance and you know Obviously, surfing is a sport that requires a lot of balance. Uh, you know, you're going to stand on one foot, kind of like yoga. Um, but balance is a, is a metaphor for so much more. It's about the balance of our family and our work, um, balance of our physical and spiritual selves. Um, you know, diet, exercise, the right kind of sleep, some type of of um, some type of meditation. I don't mean um and sitting. I mean meditation can be an activity that you love that is worth doing when you're alone. It doesn't have to have a bunch of background noise. Something that makes you feel whole. That's the balance. And the, the Buddhists, you know, they talk about the middle path, which, uh, you know, in, in sort of different, different versions of Buddhism, they talk a lot about the, the middle path. And the middle path basically means, you know, everything has its place and balance. You, you, you know, you have a healthy amount of exercise and you eat the right thing and you think, you, you think about things in a balanced way and you try to keep your life centered so that you can know yourself, so you can be of service to others, and so you can reach your potential as a human. Strength is the next core value of surfers. Um, and obviously, any sport requires a certain amount of physical strength. I, I, I alluded to this, oh, I actually talked about it earlier, but you know, none of us get through this life, none of us get through our experience on this plane of existence without feeling some very, very significant pain. You know, it may happen to you now, it may come in the future, but eventually everyone feels, everyone's heart gets broken a lot of times and everyone loses people that are very close to them. And everyone experiences great joy. What we want to do is maximize that joy and, and minimize that pain by sort of accepting the nature of our existence, that it is pain, that we go, we have pain in our life. And the, one of the main things to help us with that is to grow and build, guard our strengths. And that doesn't just mean your body strength. I mean, that's an important part of, of, of good living is, is having a healthy body and, you know, we're animals, we gotta exercise. I mean, you know, we, we're not, we're, we're the, you know, dogs need to run and so do we, it's, it's not that different. Um, but, but we also need, because we are a, a, a different kind of animal that hasn't existed yet, we need to, it develop and guard and conserve strength, mental strength, and so we need to put ourselves through mental exercises. And, and I'm I know I'm preaching the choir here because this is an extremely accomplished group, um, and I, and I think that you know you guys know the value of hard work, or you wouldn't be sitting in this room. And 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 you know you you to be very commended for that. Um, we also, with that mental and physical strength, we need to prepare for emotion, emotionally, for what we're going to face as we go through life. And we need to keep a reserve up because things will happen. 
and you know we 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 want to not let those beat us down we want to remember that that's part of the joy of living the pain and and the, and the good stuff it all comes together we wouldn't have all the good without the bad so nurture that strength of spirit and remember that as you go through life things are going to try to chip away at that and you don't have to let it you just have you, you just need to be aware it's coming and, and don't don't deny that you know it's coming that way two more for the surfers uh, commitment that hardcore I talked about being hardcore the commitment is really about when you choose to do something you're in it so whatever you decide to commit to and and I know that you've committed scholastically and, and, and through activities here already but whatever you when you, you're picking your life path make sure that commitment is is what you want to do make sure you're not having it imposed on you by other people or not doing it to keep someone else happy um, and make sure it's not just the version of you that's really self-indulgent because we all have that side to it and you don't you're not just committing the party in you're not just committing to having a good time I mean you know you want to do all that stuff but you want to you want to commit to something that will nurture you through the course of your life and so you know don't be in a rush to choose what you're going to do but when you do choose it put everything into it a lot of us now I think we have this tendency to kind of ride the fence like oh I'm gonna I think I'm gonna join this I'm gonna do this but then you're kind of like well I want to make sure I don't you know I don't want to look bad I'm, gonna, you know, I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time practicing this if I don't really get good and I don't want people to see me fail and all that kind of stuff I, I think commitment is about losing some of that fear and just committing to it but but committing to something that that, that nurtures you so when you pick it make it yours um, when when you're choosing a path when I talk about riding the fence I, I'm gonna come back to surfing again because it's, it's my comfort spot but you know again fortunately I've been able to travel a lot and surf a lot of beaches and some of that volunteer work that um, what happened during the introduction has allowed me to travel to all beaches all over the planet and surf in a lot of places and you know there's a lot of different kinds of surfing out there there's 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 performance surfing and then there's you know kind of a, a stylish longboard kind of thing or stand-up paddle boarding and, and then there's big wave surfing and um, uh, you know I, from Texas I'm obviously not a big wave surfer in that in that sense of it but I have surfed some pretty pretty big surf and one thing that every big wave surfer will tell you is that it is really important to commit if you are at all hesitant you have to you have to once you're in once you make that decision that wave that big giant wave coming at me I'm getting that one and once you once you do that and you start paddling any thought of failure has to be put aside your fear you have to you have to acknowledge that fear and you have to to get past it I'm not saying don't feel afraid but you have to not let it affect your performance and once you go to take off on that wave you're in it if you're at all hesitant you're gonna you can get hurt really badly so you know once you commit you're all the way in and, that, and that's a real again it's a metaphor for life once you commit to something commit to it Eat for better or for worse and you know one but you, you know you evaluate and then you go for it and the final one is uh, connection and you know I talked about connecting to the ocean and connecting to whatever it is that's hard to talk about that's beyond us in this room um, but there's there's a lot of kinds of connection that are very valuable throughout your life there's connection to community um, which would include being a service to others and the value that 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 has while we're here helping other people um, being a particip participating member of a group uh, you know so if you do join a group and you're in a group here and you're in another you know other groups and you're part of this high school and all that you know don't just sit back and, and, and don't just sit back and kind of play it cool and and try not to like take any risks I mean you're in it do it I mean who cares you know you let make it work for you um, so be connected let yourself be connected and that includes family and family's not to me is not just blood I mean blood family is a very important thing it, it may be one of the most important things but when you accept people into your family whether it be your 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 family of friends you know they're in and 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 you you need to you need to, to let to let them in and to give them everything you can and kind of get over your own personal needs to help other people it seems like the reward is so much greater 
when you do stuff for other people, it comes back around so many more times on you. Um, I, I was at a funeral this morning, and so I guess I'm a little bit emotional about this right now, but it was a good friend of mine uh, who's a police chief out at um, Jamaica Beach, Andy McLean. And he was a guy that was very connected to community. He was a guy that would come, you know, if you needed a mattress moved <laughs> at 11 o'clock at night from your house to somewhere else and you didn't have a truck and he did, he'd be the guy that would say, yeah, I'll come over there and do it. And not a big deal. And, and, I, and I, you know, he had more people at his funeral than I've ever seen in my life. If any of you guys um, had seen the traffic up there on the seawall, he had people from police agencies and friends and family from all over. They packed this church. They were piled outside. And, you know, you have to have lived a good life to fill up a big church. That, that, that's a real sign that you know, I mean, people don't just show up in the middle of the work day because they feel obligated to. Um, and then, of course, connection to the natural environment. We didn't touch on that, but that's, a, that's such a key thing. I mean, this earth is so little, and we're all so interconnected all over the planet. And, um, you know, we have a, a tendency, I think, in the U.S. to think of our borders as the border to the world. And, and, and the, you know, the days that we could even think like that are so gone economically, but also environmentally. So remember that, that your little piece of whatever that little thing is you can do, to reduce the amount of, of uh, junk you leave around um, matters because you'll be affected by it. You know, if you're if you're 16, by the time you're 40 or 50, you know it's really going to be a different place if, if people don't get their act together there. Um, and then that connection to something beyond our physical existence is so important. You know, I talked about that moment of riding a wave or shooting the basket or making art where, where suddenly you know you guys have you have that activity where you're doing it and all of a sudden you realize two hours has gone by and you haven't had a thought about your if some guy or girl likes you or you haven't had a thought about you're hungry i mean you just you're just in the moment and that experience is one of the best gifts that we have on the, you know while we're here um so look for that magic it's everywhere if you're receptive to it and it's nowhere if you're not so you know take take the time to find it yourself it's not a group activity um, on, to finish up, um, I have this, uh, this poem that I have kind of carried through. I, I first was introduced to it when I was, when I was about a sophomore in high school, and it's kind of gone with me uh, through life. And I, I basically have it memorized. I, I, I read it when I need it. Um, it's on my wall at work, and uh, I don't read a lot of poetry. Uh, it just really stuck to me. Um, and it, some of you guys will know it and some won't, but it's called um, Desiderata. And it was, the rumor is, the urban legend is, that it was on, um, in Baltimore, that it was, it was um, when the church in 1692, it was written in. But actually it wasn't, it was written, um, let's see, it was, I got it right here. It was, it was written in 1927, but the guy that wrote it, Max Ehrman, wrote the, uh, it, the date of, on the, of the church when the church was built on there somewhere and people who misinterpreted it but so if you hear about it some people will tell you it's a really old poem and some will say it's a kind of old poem I like the I like thinking and I'm going to continue to think that the 1692 date because I think this 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 can go everywhere I mean I think it, it would apply from then to now and into the future go placidly amid the noise and haste and remember what peace there may be in silence as far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly, and listen to others, even the dull and the ignorant. They too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexations to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain and bitter. For always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble. It's a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself. Especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love. For in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is as perennial as the grass. Take kindly to the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the, surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden, sudden misfortune. But don't distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. 
Beyond the wholesome, wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You're a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it's clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace, at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be, and whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace within your soul. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy. And I'll add, ride the wave. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. Davis. I think we can really find a way to apply those words to our individual lives. Now I have the pleasure of introducing five extraordinary NHS members. These seniors were voted upon by all of NHS to receive the annual senior scholarships in the areas of scholarship, leadership, service, character, and outstanding senior. Here to light our candles representing the four NHS principals is, Ni is Naomi Duru, winner of the Outstanding Senior Scholarship. Our first senior to come speak is Shanali Warnicola Saria, winner of the Scholarship Award. Scholarship means a commitment to learning. A student is willing to spend hours in reading and study, knowing the lasting benefits of a cultivated mind. We should continue to learn even when formal education has ended, for education ends only with the end of life. Knowledge is one great element in life which leads to the highest success and it can be acquired in one way, through diligence and effort. Learning furnishes the lamp by which we read the past and the light which illuminates the future. Candidates have the charge to continually expand their world through the opportunities inherent in scholarship. Thanks, Janali. Our second senior to come speak is Kazia Thomas, winner of the Service Award. My office is service. Service can be described in various ways. In the routine of the day's work, many opportunities arise to help others. Willingness to work for the benefit of those in need without monetary compensation or recognition is the quality we seek in our membership. We are committed to the idea of volunteering our time and abilities to the creation of a better tomorrow. Thanks, Kazia. Next is Bryce Willie, winner of the Leadership Award. Leadership. Leadership should exert a wholesome influence on the school and take an initiative in the class and school activities, a real leader strives to train and aid others to obtain the same objectives. The price of leadership is sacrifice, the willingness to yield one's personal interests for the interest of others. A leader has self-confidence and will go forward when others hesitate. Sometimes, a leader has to go off script. No matter what power and resources may exist in a country, they are ineffectual without the guidance of a wise leader. Leadership is always needed. Thus, to lead is a substantial charge to each of our members. Thanks so much for that, Bryce. Last but not least is Lana Welford, winner of the Character Award. <laughs> Character is the force within each individual which distinguishes that person from others. It gives us our individuality. It is that without which no one can respect oneself, nor hope to attain the respect of others. It is this force of character that guides one through life and, when once developed, grows steadily. Character is achieved and not received. It is the product of constant action, daily striving to make the right choices. The problem of character is the problem of self-control. We must be in the reality that we wish to appear to others. By demonstrating such qualities as respect, responsibility, trustworthiness, fairness, caring, and citizenship, we may hope to prove by example what we value character. Thank you, Lana, and to the rest of the scholarship recipients for those inspiring words. Now is the moment you've all been waiting for. At this time, I'd like to begin the induction and call the new members to the stage to receive their certificates. Louis Araujo.
Kristen Autry. Tyler Beckett. Bryson Bassett. Emma Bassett. Sari Bell. Michael Butler. Carrie Callender. Ellie Cherry Holmes. Kaylee Coulter. Miles Cooley. Dylan Davidson. Will Dickerson. Chase Dolphy. Nathan Dutzel. Rebecca Easton. Emily Elson. <laughs> Dominic Elsner. Constanza Fernandez. <laughs> Crystal Fuentes. Mateo Garofalo. <laughs> B. 
Bailey Glenn. Stephanie Gomez. <laughs> Tanya Gonzalez. Hunter Green. <laughs> Emily Hall. Quinton Hamis. Ryan Haven. Natalie Henson. Sheridan Hopkins. Maria Castis. <laughs> Annie Kinney. Jacob King. <laughs> Hannah Kirby. Heather Kirby. <laughs> Matthew Kovacs. Brandon Laughlin. <laughs> Angelica Mendoza. Marcy Michaud Hansen. <laughs> Sean Mifflin.
Kylie Morgan. Alyssa Nash. Angelica Ortiz. Yareli Perez Carrasco. Devin Peterson. Devin Pleasant. Margarita Ramos. Aurora Ryan Miller. Cassidy Robinson. Joey Rosencrantz. Omar Sada. Amanda Sendejas. Jacob Simon. <laughs> Olivia Sostrom. Anthony Springer. <laughs> Todd Streck. Joseph Termini. <laughs> Samuel Toth. Brandon Urbina.
Jesse Zapata. Gabriella Zapata. Yuvu Zhou. The high purposes of the National Honor Society to which I have been selected. I will be true to the principles for which it stands. I will be loyal to my school and will maintain and encourage high standards of scholarship, service, leadership, and character. You may be seated. Now I'd like to call National Honor Society President Lauren Valentine to give her charge to the new members. Okay. To our newest members of National Honor Society, I say congratulations and welcome to the club. You're in. You got the invite to this party. So you might be asking yourselves, now what? What am I supposed to do with a piece of paper, a candle, and a list of four qualities to maintain and encourage? Well, I'm glad you asked. High school students speak of these four years as a time to figure themselves out. Figure out what they want to do, where they want to go, and who they want to be. All this figuring can many times clutter important objectives. So my charge to you is this, to be a figure. Be a figure of leadership. Be a figure of diligence and perseverance. When everyone else is saying, I don't got time for that, be the somebody that makes time. Be the person who stands up to the plate, ready and willing to go the distance. When given the choice, choose the path, path less trodden. Rebel against the easy way out. Have the courage to choose what is right and lead others to do the same. There is a theory that you have a greater chance of someone stopping to help you with a flat tire on a single country back road than on a five o'clock traffic jammed LA freeway. It's due to something called diffusion of responsibility, a someone else will stop to help mentality. With this in mind, I charge you to be that figure of responsibility. Be the person who stops to help. Don't expect others to do it. Don't rationalize you not doing it, just do it, trademark Nike, and create a habit of doing so. Be a figure of compassion. Reach out to the hurt or struggling. Care for the people who need your help most and look out for them. Finally, I charge you to be a figure for this honor society, this school, this community, and beyond. Combining all the qualities stated, use the power and resources you have been given to accomplish something no one else has done before, something influential, something great. Use that piece of paper as a reminder that you are an outstanding individual and have the support of a fantastic group of people. Use that candle as a reminder to do all that you are capable of before your time here burns out and use those four qualities, scholarship, service, leadership, and character, as guiding tools in all of your actions. So, have you figured it out? Thank you and congratulations. I have the honor of concluding the ceremony. It's been a really amazing ceremony. Um, congrats to the new members. NHS is a lot of work, but it's always meaningful and it's always worth it, and I'm really glad to be a member. I want to say a couple thank yous. Thank you to Peter Davis and Lauren Valentine. Your words are truly inspirational, and I hope we can carry them in our day-to-day -day lives. Thanks to Dr. Hay, to Mr. Nichols and Mr. Pillar, to Dr. Ricks, and to Mr. Mahaffey and Allison, who helped 
put this whole thing together and did a really amazing job at it. Thanks to all the members on stage because you guys are truly extraordinary. And to all the other members who made this possible. And finally, thank you to the faculty council. Now everyone is invited to attend a reception in the commons generously catered by the Monroe family. NHS members, please keep in mind that it is mandatory that you attend and sign the book. Thank you all for a great induction and have a great night. <laughs>